processor very quickly. Um, the NSF is probably the most challenging grant to get. They award maybe one to two percent of the people that apply for it. If you can find a way to get an NSF grant, you might end up being principal of the year, um, personnel of the year. Um, so if you have the time and energy to search for the NSF, that might be something that you might want to look at. So fundraising. Those of you that are in early childhood elementary, probably not as important. But in secondary, you know fundraising is the lifeblood of organizations. Organizations need money to support the activity funds, and you have to raise funds. So I have some advice that I think is important for fundraising. There's a lot in the book, but I want to give you some advice too. Um, this, is, this is my opinion. Um, and this was my opinion from the secondary level. Um, and if you can do this, this will put you in the best shape to be successful. The first fundraising that should be priority is the varsity football team and the marching band. They should have say. This is your driver. This is your lifeblood at the school level. Make sure their funding and what they're selling and what they're doing comes first. I know people don't necessarily agree with that, but the truth is your football team and your marching band do really supply a lot of your money boosters and in, in, in funding for organizations. Then go to academic organizations and then other sports. Focus on your National Honor Society next, then go to other sports. When you're doing fundraising, nothing can overlap. Um, if one organization is selling uh, hoagies, make sure the other one isn't. If one's selling chocolate-covered pretzels, make sure another one isn't, because then you're competing with each other, and that's a bad thing. So the textbook mentions anytime there's fundraising, you have to deal with parents. That's 100% true. Um, they get overly involved in it. Sometimes we'll take it on and we'll do it for the students. That can be good. That can be bad doesn't teach students responsibility, but then the parents try to get involved with it and they try to make the decisions. You have to make sure that inventory and money is kept by somebody you trust or just by you, and then you want to set policies that reflect that at the building level. So the fiscal education and information management system computer programs, these are district specific. Um, the district will supply one for you, you use it. Looking at the ones that are provided in the book might help, but it's really not going to matter. The district is going to have their own program, their own system. You have to adjust and account for what the district is doing. So um, if you don't know accounting, the software builds it in itself. It'll tell you when there's an error. If you have a background in accounting, that's a tremendous help for you. Um, and one of the reasons why I teach school finance is because I do have a background in accounting. And I like the fact that you, know, you, can, you can basically see where the money's going, where it's flowing. Um, and I think that's important when you're looking at accounting procedures for, for district level improvement. So what do you need to know? And this comes directly from the textbook. You can read this on your own. But I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of the important ones that you have to make sure. Um, you have to make sure that the public funds are used to ensure academic achievement of students. You've done everything legally. If there's embezzlement or theft, it's handled almost instantaneously. And if there's any problems, the general community needs to be aware of it almost immediately. So when you're working with school accounting, the NCES really gave you some basic accounting practices. We want to look at accounting classifications and codes. We spoke about that when we were doing an earlier chapter in Money in Schools. There have to be safety and security. You have to make sure that not only you're looking at the accounting, but the building secretary is as well, other personnel are, and then comply with state and federal laws that are different. And you're going to have to adjust each one of them as you go. So we're going to talk about collection and deposit structures. This is also important because this is going to be a dollar generating initiative in the school. So how do principals get in trouble? Sex first, money second. So Normally, principals are likely to embezzle from the school activity account. Thousands of dollars flow through this, and you can honestly get away with sneaking money out of it without people knowing if it gets reimbursed within the month. That's how principals get in trouble. Um, they, even if you have an activity custodian, and we talked about this when we were looking at the Oklahoma law, the, this notion of the activity custodian, um, the principal has to, has to oversee this anyway. And you have that responsibility as the building leader. You need to safeguard it. Um, you, you have to trust your secretary. Your secretary is your most important personnel member. 
um, and you have to trust them, and they can let you know if something's going wrong. So what do you have to do? You have to collect cash receipts. This is easy. Have two individuals sign the receipt, hopefully the organization sponsor, hopefully the secretary, um, and that'll be used for reimbursement. Anything that's signed before reimbursement, you want to make sure that it's posted on the activity account level. Um, use it for bookkeeping and use it to enter the school district as well. Bank deposit procedures. Um, try to be consistent with this. If there's a specific day or time of the month that you do this, do it every single time in every single month. That's going to help you more. Um, when you're dealing with bank deposits, if you make a deposit every Friday, that's much more important um, that you are consistent with that. Because if you don't, somebody's going to say, oh, well, something's going wrong here, and then we can have issues and we can have problems. Um, once it's received, you need to double check and do a bank reconciliation. If something's wrong, you've got to catch it, and trust me, things go wrong. So it's your responsibility if that occurs. So. Um, you'll see in a lot of these fiscal structures and building infrastructures, sometimes there are discounts that are offered if a bill or invoice is paid early. If that happens, take advantage of it. This gives extra money for the school, you can use it for other things, and that can lead you with funds to spend for other things. One of the most important things that you can do is pay your bills on time. If you do that, that's also going to build experience for you as well. So we're going to talk about different budgetary systems. This is kind of an overlap of what we did with money in schools, but I also think it's important to mention it again. So the function object budgeting system really looks at different categories, whether or not it's instructional, administrative, health systems, transportation, property plan equipment, and then objects is the specific item that it is. This allows you to be transparent and administrators to see where the money's going and in which categories it goes to. So this is good because it allows for sensible decision making. Um, even if you don't have experience in budgeting, everybody that's watching this and taking this class is smart enough to understand the difference between buying something for instruction or buying something for, for technology or, or equipment. Um, if you use this system, it's sensible and it makes sense and it'll allow for different types of expenditures and it's very transparent. So. Um, you're not going to have many justifications with this. For long-term planning, this is tough because you're looking at a specific object at a specific period of time. So that's a weakness of the system, and that's something you need to consider as well. So this region, um, this region, this area, um, Tulsa, Stillwater, I'm not familiar with Oklahoma City yet, but I'm going to assume that they're using zero-based budgeting as well. Most of the school districts in this region will use zero-based budgeting. Um, you basically take every consideration, rank it in order, and then look for alternatives for the needs. Meaning, if there's this big instructional program that you want, what's an alternative? Is it going to be cheaper if you go this way versus the other way? If you use a traditional uh, Houghton Mifflin hardcore math system versus, uh, in versus integrated math, what are the costs associated with it? What are the software costs? That sort of thing. This takes time and paperwork, and it's cumbersome. If you don't have a financial manager at your district and you're using zero-based budgeting, this is going to impact so much of your time as a building principal, and you need to be aware of that. So school-based budgeting is much more decentralized. Um, we're going to talk about this in the next chapter. Um, School-centered, the teaching staff has voice. In an ideal world, our, every single textbook that we look at says that we should be using school-based budgeting. It, all the research literature says it, but you and I know that the district is going to have autonomy over what's done, so is the state, so is the federal government, but if we're looking at schools as individualized organizations, we need to think about school-based budgeting and how that can be used and how that can improve the system. So why is school-based budgeting good? Because you're looking at the needs of the teaching staff. Um, the teaching staff has input and they can decide how you spend your money and what you spend your money on. Um, if you can show an increase in academic achievement, the people making the decision are at the school level and not with central administration, and that's big as well. So the challenges with this are community members get involved. That can be good, that can be bad, but when community members get involved, they might have their own agendas, their own priorities, um, and that can cause problems with equity, especially in your larger school districts. If your community members believe that there needs to be money for a new basketball stadium, um, and they're the ones that are on the school board, that might hurt instruction. 
Um, and that can cause personnel challenges, legal entanglements, and that can be an issue as well. So then we talk a little bit about auditing. This is the final part of the chapter. I'm gonna give you some concepts on this and what you need to do as a building leader. So auditing allows you to determine if money has been spent appropriately and it's been spent legally. It provides written documentation to everybody that's been involved in the decision-making process. If there's been human error, it will provide for that as well. And it can bring about change to the accounting procedures when necessary. So as a building principal, you're going to possibly have to deal with fraud at some point in your career. You're in charge of a system and somebody might try to steal money. Um, I want to tell you who's most likely to embezzle money, and this is based off of research. Most of the time, women are likely to embezzle money. 64% of the time it's women. Once again, this is not something that I'm making up. This is coming directly from our textbook. Um, most of them are ones that are in the accounting office or the finance department because they basically see a loophole where they can borrow money and replace it as they need it. Um, most of the time they act alone and they'll do it working singly, they're well dressed, um, but that's who embezzles money in organizations. So some precautions for embezzlement, this is directly from the textbook, you can look at this on your own. Um, the things that I want to think that's important that I note, um, I like number three and number five a lot, have two separate sets of bookkeeping records. Um, this is why you hire a good secretary, one that will do their own thing and you do your own thing, that can help. And don't sign blank checks before leaving for a conference or vacation because then you get an even worse situation because then somebody could just put money on it and then you come back and it's gone. Um, you want, you want an independent accountant, if you can afford one, to kind of do an audit maybe once or twice a year. That's a big idea. Um, and try to work with the office staff on ways to do the budgeting when you possibly can. So, so there are some other things that could be considered. Um, you know, there are, there, are some, there are some other things you know, that, that can potentially cause fraud in schools. You might just avoid a problem. Um, people are going to ask, were you aware of what happened? You know, did you do something transparently if you knew somebody was embezzling money? If you did, did you go to the school board? Did you go to the superintendent? Um, and that can hurt you because it might make it look like you were in support of the decision they were making. So why principals get fired? You know, I said it was sex and money, but this is honestly why principals get fired. First is for sex, second is for mismanagement, Third is if they forge documentation, going to conferences, and then also data manipulation as well. So that's it for this chapter. This is a very long chapter. Um, the next chapter is going to be long, but not as many slides. But it's important information as you're working with your budget. Uh, if you need anything else that I can do to help, please let me know. Thank you.